I'm on the road in northeast Iran, about to meet the first of our master musicians. In this program, we're going to be hearing some of the top folk musicians of the country. Now that the situation in Iran is getting more relaxed, this is in many ways a pioneering trip. These musicians are well known in their own communities. They've released tapes here in Iran, but have certainly not been heard on British radio. We're going to be hearing music from five regions. Mazandaran on the Caspian Sea, Azerbaijan in the northwest, Kurdish music from the west, and wild fiddle playing from Loristan. We're beginning here in Khorasan, in the northeast of the country. Purple mountains in the distance, and we're on a dusty plain sprinkled with fruit gardens. With me is Kehan Kalhor, the virtuoso of the Kamanche, Spike Fiddle, and it was he that first suggested I should come to Iran to record these musicians. Kehan, Iranians always talk about this region, Khorasan, as an important cultural center. Why is that? Well, because uh, Khorasan has always been regarded as the cradle of Persian civilization. First of all, it was along the Silk Road, and it contained several important cities, and it was the birthplace of several important poets and Sufi thinkers. And of course, a lot of folk music of Iran comes from the spiritual roots. One of the first names that comes up when you talk about music from Khorasan is that of Hajj Gorban Suleimani, and that's whom we're going to visit now. We've come to Aliabad, a small village of low houses of mud brick. Kehan, who is Hajj Gorban? Uh, Hajj Gorban Suleimani is uh, one of the last bards or troubadours or bakhshis of this area, which means he's an important musician who is expected to be able to do several things, such as making his own instrument, Dutar, the instrument which is special to Bakhshis, uh, the two-string long neck lute, and uh, write poems, and sing, and believe it or not, uh, sometimes solving people's problems in the village. One of the functions of the Bakhshis was also playing at the weddings and important musical occasions, which Hazgorban did for 50 years during his musical life, and that made him a very uh, well-respected and important figure of music of this region.
This song is about a person who's talking to his God, who's asking for his help, and he's telling him that you're my only hope. Your name's been mentioned in Quran several times. You're the only hope I have. And it's all about uh, asking for spiritual help from his God. Kehan, could Hajj Gobam tell us a little bit about himself? He says he's 78. He's been born in this village, Aliabad, and he's lived here all his life. And he's a farmer, and he learned playing guitar from his father, and he started to do weddings and ceremonies when he was 19. And he started playing when he was eight, so he says, I, I've been playing this instrument for 70 years. <laughs> you, you said that Hajj Gorban used to sing at weddings and things. Could he describe for us what those wedding occasions were like? Of course, in the old times, there weren't any cars, so he was picked up by a mule or a horse. He actually chose the weddings or the receptions that he wanted to play in because he didn't really want to go in anyone's wedding, only the important ones. But in the beginning of the night, they had dinner. Um, and then about 200, 300 people gathered in a very big room. And he had a special place, and, and there was a big lamp in front of him. And he started with songs. He played several songs. And then after that, people asked him to tell them stories. And he started with a very long story. That uh, He says uh, ceremonies usually could go on from anywhere from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. or longer and then he wouldn't finish the story by then even and the rest of the story would be told the day after that till the noon and then after the lunch the wedding took place could you ask him if he could play uh, another song to finish <laughs> this is another devotional song named Zulfagari in which he's going to be accompanied by his son, Ali Reza, on the second guitar. <laughs> Good 
Now we've moved west from Khorasan, and believe it or not, we're sitting on the beach, looking out to sea. Well, it looks like the sea, but it's actually the world's biggest lake, the Caspian Sea. But it's got big waves, and it's got beach huts, and it's got big plastic balls on sale. This part of the Caspian coast is called Mazandaran, and we're near the town of Sari, and the climate and landscape is much more Mediterranean than the dry, rugged area of Khorasan. Kehan, what is it that interests you about the music of this region? Well, my first exposure to Persian folk music happened here, and I loved the music ever since. Because Mazandaran was sort of a strategical place throughout the history, this place becomes a sort of meeting place for different races, such as Turkish, Kurdish, and Persians, and uh, the local people here. And this gives it special melting pot quality, and that all this music from different regions come here and, and become one and affect each other. And uh, one of the very important aspects of this music for me is the wild um, quality of sound that's made by different instruments and singer. For instance, lalava, a bamboo flute, the way it's played and the, 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 the way the sound is produced is very distinctive among our folk instruments uh, throughout Iran. Now that's the very beautiful sound of the laleva, which is the local reed flute from Mazandaran region. Yes. A little bit like the ney in Persian classical music. Played there by uh, Mr. Arslan Taebi. What is the music he's playing? What sort of music is this? <laughs> The piece he just played uh, named Dr. Amujan Gallar Burdan, meaning, oh cousin, they're still in the herd of the sheep, which is uh, categorized uh, as shepherd music. A lullaby is actually a very important instrument for a shepherd. And he says in the old times, uh, if, if um, a shepherd did not have a lullaby or did not play a lullaby, they, they would make fun of him. So uh, it's, it, it was a necessary instrument for a, for a shepherd to have or play. The, the instrument that 
Arsalan is playing is beautifully decorated. Can we just have a have a look? Who made it? Did he make it himself? <laughs> But the actual instrument has been made by his father, who is responsible with revitalizing this instrument again. And the carvings on the instrument is done by a friend of his. The lalava is a reed tube, about 35, 40 centimeters long, decorated with abstract patterns at the top, and then birds from about halfway down, birds sitting on uh, leaves and trees. There must be about eight or nine birds, and then sort of palm trees at the bottom. It's, it's very beautifully etched in, in just fine, fine lines. It's got six holes, and I noticed that when, uh, when he's playing it, he uses circular breathing, which gives a constant flow of air, so he's not audibly taking breaths. Is that an important part of the technique of the instrument? Yeah, that's a definitely very important part of the playing technique of Lelava, which also makes the playing technique very different from the that of the classical uh, nay playing technique. Is there something that Aslan can play to finish off? He's going to play us a song uh, named Mashti, who is um, actually a, a kind of Robin Hood figure uh, from the turn of the century, who stole from the, uh, from the rich and gave it to the poor. So this is the story of him, that people actually made the story. And he's going to be joined by Muslim Fahimi and Dutar. Sari to Tehran, we pass Mashti's village, perched high in the mountains above the road. You can still only get there on horseback. Mashti always outwitted the authorities until he fell sick and they murdered him in his bed. <laughs> Oh, 
Iran is a country with a rich mosaic of peoples. After the Persians themselves, the largest group are the Azeris, making up 25% of the population. The Iranian region of Azerbaijan is in the northwest of the country, west of the Caspian Sea. And now, Kehan is taking me to meet Cengiz Medipur, originally from Tabriz, one of the main cities of the area. But now he lives in Tehran, like many musicians from around the country. So we're doing a long journey across the city in the baking sunshine through <laughs> the traffic that, that clogs up the city. Um, and I'm in there <laughs> <laughs> as well. Kehan, can you tell me a little bit about Cengiz Medipur? Well, um, Cengiz is a uh, very young and enthusiastic musician that he's actually my favorite musician from Azerbaijan part. He comes from a family of musicians, so he's got all the repertoire and uh, he knows the music uh, very well. And he also has his own innovations in music, which actually, to my opinion, doesn't uh, take away the purity of folk music as the way it should be. The other reason is he's a true virtuoso and he's one of those members of this musician families that comes along once in a while, maybe after three, four generations, and uh, it does not repeat in every generation, and he's exceptional in that way. Uh, very exciting player. This piece of music is called Osman Divane, which was uh, composed by a minstrel called Ashok Lobani, who lived 500 years ago. He was at the service of Shah Ismail, one of the Safavid kings. And this piece is the actual piece that Ashok Lobani wrote for Shah Ismail Safavid.
From the evidences uh, seen, stone carving and statues, this, this kind of music goes back to 9,000 years ago. Stone carvings showing the musicians playing this sort of instruments. Could you tell me a little bit about the instrument he's playing? The instrument is called Qopuz. It's a pear-shaped instrument, a little deeper than a half pear, actually. And then uh, the belly and the soundboard are made of mulberry wood, and the neck is made of uh, walnut, and it has nine strings. It's got an amazing rich sound, and, and also its own, the way he plays it, it sounds like a rhythm section as well. He really uses the noises of the instrument, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he, he makes sounds with tapping his hand on the soundboard, and there is a lot of uh, dynamic nuances in his playing, as well as rhythmic changes and a lot of uh, very interesting elements. And how did he learn the music? He's learned from his uncle, who was Ashik as well, who was uh, a famous Ashik in Azerbaijan. And uh, he says, um, ever since I could remember, I heard his instrument and then I took lessons from him. Has the music of these pieces literally been passed down for 500 years? Well, as you well know, this, this is an uh, improvised tradition improvised kind of music. So, uh, first of all, we can't really date back pieces that uh, how old they are and when uh, they were composed, but what is certain is whomever played them, played them in a different way and added something to the piece or omitted a, a little piece. So what he plays, the main structure of it, um, he's played as, as, as a student and then he improvises on it. This piece is a part of epic cycle uh, called Kuroglu. And uh, Kuroglu is a very famous story in Turkish language, which means uh, a son of a blind man. And this particular one, which is an instrumental piece, is called Misur Kuroglu. As Cengiz is telling us, it means uh, the sword of Kuroglu.
One of my favourite things about travelling in Iran are places like this, a roadside tea house. After a long, hot journey in the baking sun, you can cool off. The hot water from the tea comes out of a huge metal samovar, and we drink it sitting cross-legged on a carpeted platform. We've come about 500 kilometres west of Tehran into the Kurdish region. There are impressive mountain ridges with open wheat fields on the flat ground between them. It's midsummer and it's harvest time. The Kurds make up around 8% of the Iranian population, but here they are in the vast majority. Kehan, what is it you want to show me here? There are many different kinds of music in Kurdistan, but I'm going to introduce you to an aspect of it which is probably little known: the devotional music of this region. We're going to meet a tambour player named Muhammad Ahmadi, who is a very respected tambour player among Ahl Haq community, which means people of truth. Muhammad Ahmadi is an active member of this community, a tambour player who regularly participates in their devotional ceremonies. Imam Ali is the most important figure in Shiism, the Iranian version of Islam. In this song, the tambour player is talking to Ali and asks him to help him with his problems. Of course, not the earthly problems, but the spiritual ones. <laughs> Yeah, aside from the fact that uh, every kind of music uh, should be able to reflect the inner side of the player, um, of course this kind of music is, is, is very special because, for example, he says that he has to be in special state to be able to play it really well and to, to feel what he feels. And he says sometimes, for example, when I play, I, uh, I feel weightless with the music. He says that he thinks that this is a very delicate and old instrument. The first effect of this instrument is to calm your soul down in a very spiritual way. And then when you get to that state, the sound of tambour should be able to make you happy not happy in a way that you want to dance or you want to do something crazy but it makes your soul happy and it gets you closer to your inner side it, it makes your spirit happy 
We've come winding through the mud brick back streets of a town called Gavare to a lovely courtyard piled high with mulberry wood. You can hear it being chopped and planed in the background into the tambours that they make here. Kehan, who is the tambour maker that we've come to, to visit? His name is Ustad Asadullah. He makes tambours with his brother Ustad Yadullah and their ninth generation of family of tambour makers. And right now they're, they make the best tambours in this area. The best tambour makers, period. <laughs> they're the tambour makers. Tell me what a tambour is and what it's made of. Tambour is a plucked string instrument, plucked with the uh, fingers of right hand, and uh, specially associated with the religion in this area. Is the tambour particularly associated with Kurdish music? Yes, it is. And it's only played in Kurdish-speaking parts of Iran. It is associated with their everyday life, because there is a tambour in every household here. And it's a very important part of their lives. As you saw here, you know, the very small um, child here, I, I think three or four years old, you know, plays tambour, and they just start in very early age. Well, as you can see, this is a pear-shaped sound box that's carved out of a solid piece of mulberry wood. And then the, the neck is usually walnut or apricot wood. As you can see, they make this instrument out of scratch and with very primitive tools. The way they make instruments passed on generations, and um, they haven't really changed anything. The saws, the planes, everything they use is um, the old-fashioned kind of tools. We've come now to the house of one of the best tanba players in the region, Ali Akbar Moradi. He knows a lot of the secret, sacred repertoire, but is also a virtuoso on the instrument. Fantastic instrumental playing. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Beautiful. It's really exciting. Yeah. Was it? Was that an improvisation or was that a? Um, uh, 
It's something he's working on, right? uh-huh. like a composition. Right. That is called the way to the battle. You mean it has saw the tambour key, saw the kamran. Well, first of all, we should say the tambour is an ancient instrument, one of the first uh, string instruments that came to existence. Ama yechishte chayda muhum yaseke. But the important point that we, we are sure of is that it's about a thousand years now that this instrument is being played by the people of troops. Who are they? What are they? This goes far behind um, Islam as, and it's a pre-Islamic and prehistoric uh, religion which, which is rooted in Mithraism and Zoroastrianism in, in a way. Something uh, like worshipping the sun and um, performing their ceremonies in sacred caves, for example. These all go back to the philosophy of Mithraism, which is um, the old Persian philosophy. He's going to play a religious song of the people of Truth, which is called Praise to the Sun. If you travel south from Kurdistan, you get to the isolated mountainous region of Loristan, a little less populated, a little wilder, and the music seems to have a raw edge in keeping with the landscape. I've really been looking forward to hearing the music of Loristan, because it's like the ancestral home of Kehan's instrument, the Kamanche fiddle. Kehan, who's the musician you want us to meet? We're going to meet uh, Mohamed Bajlevan, who's a relatively young musician, although uh, he's preserved a lot of essence of the true music of this region. I think his style of Kamanche playing is very pure, comparing to a lot of other Kamanche players who've been absorbed by the record industries in Tehran, and that has affected their um, traditional style of playing. And that makes Mohamed Bajlevan's playing very interesting for me. I think he's one of the most exciting Kamanji players of Loristan today.
اونجا به قول فرج همیشه سوال میکنن کمانچه این لورستانی کالچور is so important that uh, there is a کمانچه in every household so it's a necessity what's the sort of music that he plays on the کمانچه بیشتر موسیقی رقص he says mostly کمانچه uh, is used for dance music and this is the first function of the instrument and then comes the songs and the only occasion that Kamanche is not used is the funeral. Where did he learn to play Kamanche? One day he got hold of this very primitive Kamanche made of uh, oil can and a piece of wood as a neck and uh, he started to play by himself without any teacher and later on he meets this musician on the street and he says that you know he was using this kind of vibrato and that was the first time because it, I, I realized that, that all I'm not doing is <laughs> vibrato and that's how I got it you know just just looking at his hands is there a piece that you two can play together the sort of classical Camanche meets the folk Camanche what we'll try to do is to improvise based on a Loristani folk tune and I will try to listen to Mohammed and uh, let him lead a little bit and then maybe learn a little from him. Okay, so on the right is Mohammed uh, Bajlavand on the folk Kemenche, which is slightly louder with an open back. And on the left, Kehan Kalhor with the classical Kemenche, which sounds perhaps slightly sweeter, more refined. <laughs> 